Yo, yo, what's up? <laughs> I feel like I'm looking very, very rapperish today. <laughs> All right, guys, listen, I, I, I gotta say, um, I, I, I can't hold it in anymore. It is, I like literally have to make an entire video about this because it's bothering me so much. And um, I'm, I'm not trying to slam. I, I don't like the energy of slamming other health professionals. I know we are all in this, like trying to help people. But this message that I keep hearing over and over, especially in like the biohacking, toxicity, health optimization, alternative health, holistic health world, which I love all of those things. I love all those things so much. But this message frustrates me. You know why? Because I'm tired of seeing people listening to this message and getting so frustrated because they can't lose weight. And it's this message that calories don't matter. Holy shit, this really bothers me. Okay, so listen, a calorie is not a calorie. Okay, so if you eat 1,200 calories of Twinkies or 1,200 calories of processed foods versus 1,200 calories of super highly nutritious foods, whole foods from nature, you're going to live in a completely different body in reality. Okay, so the types of calories do matter so much. Your whole hormone cascade will be different. Your body composition will be different. Your like actual health of your body will be different. Your mental clarity will be different. Everything will be better when you go for the higher quality calories. But when it comes to fat loss, telling people that calories don't matter is mean and inaccurate and untrue. It does matter. It matters so much. And guess what? Macronutrients like being keto or being low carb or being higher protein or whatever is super bio individual. And, but most people like, you're going to do the one that you feel best on, but at the end of the day, the amount of calories you're eating are what's going to determine if you're going to lose body fat or not. This is common sense. Think about it. Let's say you're eating grass fed roast and avocados and, um, whole like red potatoes and sweet potatoes and, um, all sorts of only nutrient dense whole foods, but you're eating 4,000 calories a day and of those foods and you only need 1500 calories a day so you're not going to gain any body fat what you are going to gain body fat i don't care how high quality your regenerative ranch roast is if you are eating a caloric excess you are going to gain body fat now what about fat loss i don't care if you're eating all wonderfully high quality foods like I see this in the keto world so much. Like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Like, I'm eating keto. I'm in ketosis. I'm like, you're eating more calories than your body needs. I freaking promise you, or you would be digging into fat stores. And I love that I have not been keto or low carb for the last eight weeks. I have been higher protein and higher carb and lower fat. And my body fat score came in yesterday at 10.5%. My body fat percentage is 10.5. So all this message of carbs make you fat or, you know, like all, ah, that calories don't matter. It's bullshit. Calor I lost body fat because I stayed in a caloric deficit. And this message of like, that doesn't matter. This is ridiculous. I'm not saying that. I, I think what happens is when people say calories don't matter, they're, they're insinuating that all we're saying is like, eat whatever the crap you want. And, um, and just make sure you're at a calorie deficit and you're good. That's not what everybody who's in favor of caloric deficits is saying. That's not at all. I'm, I just worked with a bodybuilding coach, right? And guess what? He was more strict on me, on my food quality than, than most people I know in like the paleo keto health optimization. But he's like, no artificial sweeteners, no nothing, like completely whole foods. That's it. He's like, nothing processed at all. The only thing processed I was able to have in this whole journey of getting to 10.5% body fat was a, a, an occasional rice cake. <laughs> okay? So um, I'm just sharing this because I just I just feel like this message of, and I've, I've seen it a lot lately. That's why I'm like making a whole video about this, of calories don't matter. Um, I just saw a... I'll just, I'm just be straight. I just saw Dave Asprey put a thing about it yesterday and I'm just like, dude, or a couple days ago. And I'm like, 
this is so mean. This is, it, to me, it is mean because I work with these women and they're like, wait, but I thought calories didn't matter. Like, oh, wait, I thought, I did. no, you, you can just like change your quality of your fats and then like you lose weight. I'm like, most of the time, like if you're just, if you have a lot of weight to lose and you just start eating quality foods and you don't worry about calories, are you going to lose some weight initially? Yes. Because guess what? Your calorie intake went down because now you're eating foods that aren't as calorie dense as before. Before you were eating calorie dense foods like a mother. French fries are super calorie dense. Pizza is super calorie dense. Desserts are super calorie dense. You switched to whole foods. Guess what happened? Your calories went down. <laughs> you, know much, you know how many fewer calories are in like sweet potatoes than pizza? <laughs> okay. So anyway, I, I just, I can't even with the calories don't matter when it comes to fat loss calories freaking matter but that's okay we can listen to, I, I would also say this consider the source consider the source so I'm like all the people I know who are lean and fit are like oh yeah <laughs> they matter and the people who aren't as lean and fit are the ones that are saying that calories don't matter or maybe they're just that way you know or maybe I don't know Whatever they're doing, I promise if they are getting lean, whatever their approach is, their calories have dropped. So I'm just saying, I'm not saying you have to be a calorie counter, but if you're trying to lose body fat and you're just crap shooting it all the time and just eating healthy and you're just not getting any results, then you're going to want to do an assessment and find out what's going actually going in and what's actually come, going out on output and change it. <laughs> so anyway my little rant for the day because I, I just, the reason I'm so upset about it is because I'm tired of seeing people not get results and feeling all exasperated. They're getting indoctrinated in these like things that don't make sense. It's like, think of it like from like a business perspective or money management. That'd be like saying like tracking what comes in and what goes out, like doesn't matter. Like just, yeah, just make sure that you're making good money and you know, buying good things. I'm like, it'll work out. <laughs> like, where's the, where's the actual like, uh, accountability there? <laughs> you have to find out. Um, let's see. Once you've gone so far, it's hard to come back mentally when you believe this stuff for so long. I know girl, I am with you. Like honestly, so I'm, I'm writing a book. You guys know that it comes out at the end of this year. It's basically about doing like intermittent phases of keto. And so I'm writing about why I think a short phase of keto is helpful for a lot of people, but I'm also writing about all the freaking indoctrination that I'm seeing in a lot of the paleo, keto, primal, ancestral, biohacking, alternative health, holistic health, like ugh, there's so many freaking blanket statements being made that they're, they're not, we don't have enough evidence to just flat out say stuff like we're saying. And it's bothering me like crazy. So like, and it's very like, it's very dogmatic. It's very dogmatic. It's very elitist. It's like, this is what happens to everybody. Everybody has a gluten intolerance. Everybody has dairy allergies. Guess what? I just read like this systematic review of like a hundred studies on dairy. And they showed that for most people, people who don't have, um, uh, like a, an actual dairy intolerance that dairy actually showed over the, over the studies that they looked at actually had an anti-inflammatory benefit overall. Like the majority of them anti-inflammatory. Oh, <laughs> but we don't like to talk about that because that doesn't like, that doesn't fit our paradigm. That's, com that's confirmation bias. And like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going off on that thing. Cause I'm just, I'm very, very tired of, um, dogma in nutrition and cause I just, I work with so many people who take in a lot of this kind of information and they just have these, like, they just like they've been brainwashed instead of just being like, Hey, here's something to consider. Here's something to consider. That's, I think that's our job as health educators is to give you guys information to consider, not like, Oh yeah, that's bad, mm -mm, bad, bad. And this is good. And that's bad. <laughs> like at keto at its heyday was like, carbs are bad. And that was just, why I couldn't hang completely ever in the keto message. I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to start saying that. That's ridiculous. Carbs are not bad. It's what is needed and what is the path that will get us to what is needed. You know, Ay, ay, ay. 
there isn't enough evidence. Yeah, exactly. But that's what happens is like, it's like if there's a couple pieces of evidence, it's like, I feel like the message is like, boom, this is how it is. It's like jumping to conclusions. And it's like, wait a minute. Just because we have one piece of evidence doesn't mean that's how it is. Especially when there's other pieces of evidence, that's not how it is. And I feel like more of, um, like mainstream health, honestly, I, what I'm learning, they're just like less, less apt to jump to conclusions than a lot of like the health optimization community is. The health optimization, we have one piece of evidence. Boom. I got new info, new info for my podcast, new info for my content on social. Like, mm, I'm back. I'm like, do, 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 do. That is where I'm at right now. Just being real with you guys. I am back backing away, backing away from a lot of this like dogma that I'm seeing in nutrition. It's like, it's, um, it sucks. I'll give you an example. Like one time I knew a lady, she was like probably almost 60, like in her fifties. She said that she hadn't eaten red meat since her early twenties because, um, a, a, a trainer guy told her in her twenties that it would make her bulky. So she has not had any of the nutrients available in red meat since then. Um, she also was told that her butt would get really big if she did a stair climber. So she hasn't done a stair climber in like 40 years. This is the kind of stuff that we, we tell somebody that, and they just believe us because we're health, prof- health professionals. I just think there needs to be way more, um, accountability on the part of the educators. I, I mean, I'm sure I'm guilty of it somewhere. Call me on it. If you ever see me being dogmatic about shit, I'm really, really working on that. Cause I'm just like, it, it, it sucks to me that somebody's going to go off the rest of their life and be like, I learned that plants are, plants are toxic. Don't even get me started on lectins and phytic acid. I'll just write about it in my book. Please stop being afraid of plants unless you have an actual sensitivity to plants. <clears throat> Makes me bonkers. Most of lectins and phytic acid are removed from cooking and preparing your food. Don't be unless you have a lectin sensitivity, which is like extremely rare. <laughs> oh, yeah. I I get I get heated up because it's like okay, this is how I look at it. None of us know how the body works. None of us know how the world works. We we got dropped into this planet and there was all this food for us. And then we have people in the paleo community or the keto community or whatever saying, Mm-mm, don't eat those ones. The, 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 don't eat beans. Don't eat peanuts. Um, don't eat white potatoes. I know they're growing everywhere and they taste super good and they're full of nutrients and minerals, but don't, don't eat those. Screw you. <laughs> Screw you. Who are you to tell other people that that food is bad for them? Beans are not bad for you unless you have a sensitivity to beans. They're full of fiber and nutrients and, um, gosh, like fiber. I'm also, that's another thing that I'm just like telling people they don't need fiber. Okay. Can you technically survive without fiber? Yeah. It looks like you can, but does fiber do amazing things for your body and your mental health and your gut health and your microbial diversity in your gut? Yeah. (laughs) Does it also keep you really full? Yeah. So like freaking a, if it doesn't work for you, don't eat it, but don't go tell everybody else that like there's no need for fiber in the human diet. You have no idea what the long-term impact of that is on human beings. None. <laughs> so anyway, this kind of this kind of nutritional dogma, especially telling people that foods from nature are bad, really pisses me off. Really, really. Because it's like, you don't have enough evidence to say stuff like that. And it gives people these weird mentalities around foods. Um, all these fancy keto doctors and popular gurus that have come up with something new every year. Exactly. That's, I, I'm just being real. I'm being real. I'm sorry. I just, I have to say it. I can, like can't hold it in. Like I thought of it. I, I was thinking of it this way. I'm like, should I say this? <laughs> okay. I'm saying it. There are a lot of doctors out there helping a lot of people. Like I'm sure there's like functional medicine doctors and all sorts of doctors, like, you know, uh, some university or clinic or wherever, um, you know, educating, helping people. They're probably saving lives left and right. But why do you not know who they are? And because I don't have a freaking marketing team. And one thing I'll tell you is like, I, yeah, it's, it is difficult sometimes to help 
the general public with health. I will admit that because it's so individual. It's like, it's, you know, sometimes if you guys ever message me, DM me, people ask me questions, I'm just like, I can't tell you that. Like, I, there's no way I don't, I don't know anything about you and I'm sorry. Like this is my full-time job. I, I can't get into your entire medical history and your entire like life and your trauma and like through DMS on Instagram. Like you have to hire me for that. And I'm, so I'm not going to like get into all that, but it is difficult to give like general recommendations over the internet for most people. Right? So I know for the most part, we're all doing our best, but the thing that bugs me is this air of like, this is good. This is bad. Don't eat this. Don't eat that. Like the good, bad thinking it's, it's like, we need to get out of that and just get more into like, here's something to consider, but that might not even be, you might not even need that. That might not be an issue for you. But what happens is we get into fear mongering so people can sell you products. Yeah. Um, I have straight up told people, Oh no, my kids are FaceTiming me. It's probably gonna happen like 10 times now. Um, I have straight up told people don't do keto. You don't need to do keto. Like some people don't, if you, here's a reason I would say don't do keto. You're super lean already. You can go really long time periods of time without eating. You're like super athlete level to like crushing it in the gym. You have no issues. Like you're happy, healthy. You don't, your blood work looks great. You have no inflammation. Like, do you really need to do keto? Only if you just want to try it and see, you know? So like, yeah, I will tell people, I'm like, you don't, why, why tell everybody they need to do all these things and put fear in their mind if they don't need to. But yeah, if you have a lot of body fat to lose and fasting is really hard for you, you have inflammation for sure. If you have neurological stuff going on, if you're insulin resistant, like all of those things, um, right here, you're obese at 395 pounds and insulin resistant. Do I have to do keto to lose fat and reverse my insulin resistance? The answer to that is no, you don't have to do keto. There's other ways to do it. But what I will say to you is keto will be way easier for you than any other approach. I do feel that way because the clients that I've had that are in your same boat, what happens is when you don't have blood sugar going up like this, up and down like this all the time, for the first time in your life, you're going to be like, oh my gosh. I can actually like not feel starving all the time. Like I can actually do this. That's what I get from my clients that are like you, like you're like a perfect candidate for keto. It will be probably be the one thing that finally works is I'll put it that way. So yeah, I have highly recommend it. You should join my, um, keto, keto in and out eight week challenge, but I'm going to probably keep you keto the whole time. Heads up. I'll give you another meal plan. <laughs> you need to do keto for longer than four weeks. Um, it's also interesting how most of the popular keto people are slowly adding more carbs. I know it makes me so happy. <laughs> I'm watching. I'm like, I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen way back when keto was at its peak. That's why I started teaching do keto, not forever. Um, and keto in and out and this whole approach. Cause it just makes sense. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to tell people to never eat carbs again for their whole life. That's dumb and unnecessary. I would, it, it, I would say less than 1% of the population needs to do that. And it's going to be therapeutic for therapeutic reasons. Like they have epilepsy or something, or if you just feel better and you just want to, when you just love it and it's easy for you, like go, go for it. But that is extremely rare. And how the keto limit is now changing from 20 grams max to 50 grams, then a hundred grams, hundred grams. Dang. If you can stay in ketosis at a hundred grams, that'd be insane. I can't stay in ketosis at hundred grams of carbs. Um, I consider that low carb. Maybe if you like depleted tons of glycogen, like before and after, sure. Um, which kind of shows something they're probably adding in more high dense nutritional plant foods that make the carbs go up. Yeah. Yeah. I used to, when I was first coaching keto, I would tell people like, listen, like, I don't care if you get kicked out of ketosis every once in a while. I want you eating all the vegetables that you possibly can, all the vegetables you want. Who cares if you're out of ketosis for like an hour or two, like fill up on nutrient dense foods that keep you full and make this thing easier. Um, that's basically what I do when I pull people out of keto. Now we switch into low carb and then we gradually titrate those up and we add lots of, lots of vegetables. Vegetables are the ticket. You want to be lean, eat vegetables. But anyway, um, why? Because of the whole point of this message from the first place. And that is uh, like vegetables are very low in calories, very high in nutrition, and they keep you full because of the fiber, which also boosts your mental health and your microbial diversity of your gut and helps you like, like just be healthier in general. <laughs> right. So 
Which vegetables would you recommend the most? I can't, I can't pick a favorite. <laughs> Whatever you like. Whatever you like. So non-starchy vegetables is what I'm referring to usually when I say vegetables. I'm not talking about like um, squashes. and so, so any, like, well, summer squash, zucchini, yellow squash, onion, fry that up, some avocado oil. It's so freaking good. Add some chicken to it, some Cholula, <laughs> some, some sort of hot sauce. So good. Um, and uh, yeah, whichever ones you like, like experiment, have fun. Um, I remember when I first started really getting in vegetables, I, I grew my own Swiss chard, like rainbow Swiss chard. I was so proud of myself. I used to make this thing called eggs in a basket or something. I, yeah. And it was like, I, I would, um, so, like saute up a bunch of the Swiss chard and salt it up and then like, uh, almost like poach eggs on top of it by like dropping eggs on top of the leaves and then put a lid on it. So good. Um, and yeah, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, cruciferous vegetables, um, can help you metabolize estrogens. So I feel amazing. I have a com T genetic mutation that causes me to not, um, metabolize estrogens as well, or, um, catecholamines, which are like your upper neurochemicals. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> that means I like stay in adrenaline state for like 40% longer than, than normal. So that's something to cool to be aware of myself about, but, uh, cruciferous vegetables can help me metabolize faster. They can help with that. Um, and so, uh, I just feel amazing when I eat a lot of cruciferous vegetables and they make me super full. So that'd be like broccoli, uh, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, arugula. I know I'm forgetting some, um, yeah, those are awesome. And then of course, like leafy greens, throw them in anything you can throw them in your smoothie, throw them in, um, uh, protein shakes or whatever. Um, any, any time I'm making like, uh, like I'll just get like, uh, I don't know. It's like a smorgasbord. Like I'll have, um, fresh green beans and like frozen peas and like, uh, zucchini and whatever. Just throw them all in there. Throw some sweet potato in there. Holy cow. A bunch of protein. You'll be so full on so few calories and so many nutrients. So yeah, just be experimental. Have fun. Play around. You know, maybe hashtag vegetables, <laughs> search, follow that hashtag for you to get ideas or something on Instagram. But, um, but yeah, that's going to help your total calorie count go down. Right. And it's amazing how much you can lean out when you're getting full on foods that don't have a lot of calories because you're like, wait, I'm actually full most of the time. This is like bearable. I can do it. You love CrossFit and keep my, keep your own training plan. If I want to do your, my eight week program, you can, it's just, I'm being real. Your CrossFit workouts, when you're keto adapting, if you haven't done keto yet, your CrossFit workouts are going to be hard. You are just not going to have the juice that you normally do. So you can, can you do it? Yeah. I mean, Rachel Gregory, who I just um, released podcasts, I re-released her interviewing me on her podcast today on my Inside Out Health podcast. Hers is called Met Flex and Chill. Um, she's interviewing me about my whole like keto in and out approach. Um, so you can watch that on, um, just click on my Instagram my website and go to inside out health podcast. You'll see it right there. Um, but like, she's the one who did the study showing that people can do CrossFit on a ketogenic diet, but like you can, if you're going to do it, I would use exogenous ketones. I would pick up some exogenous ketones, like order them right now and use those to fuel your athletic performance because they have salt. The ketones are attached to salt, which is going to give you a boost. Um, it, it, you can't have good um, muscle contractions if you don't have proper electrolyte balance. So, uh, anyway, I won't get too far into it, but you can get your electrolyte balance can get off really easily on keto. So having that salt in place helps you helps prevent that. Plus you're getting the energy from the ketones. So I would just, yeah, you can do it. Is it optimal? Are you going to feel like the most awesome crossfitter in the whole entire planet and while you're keto adapting? No. So just giddy up for that, but you can still, you can still go and yes, you can still do it. Um, humans have a tendency to see the world through the lens of their own experiences. Very true. Having unconscious bias while thinking your objective leads to bold statements. Yeah. Keep questioning. Yeah. Yeah. I like to, um, I like to get, I'm like, Oh, I love this person's stuff. And then I like, I literally will like Google, like, um, try to find people who are opposed to that person so I can keep my mind open. So I don't get like become this little like religious cult follower, <laughs> right? Of like everything they say is the truth. No dude, like take the good and leave the rest and question everything. Um, thank you for doing this video. I'm vegan and still love to listen to you and respect you. 
Thank you so much. Um, yeah, vegan, vegan is like a really interesting one too. Cause like I, I I'll always respect like whatever feels good to you, like do that. But just make sure that you didn't get indoctrinated because somebody told you a bunch of stuff that didn't come from within you, you know, cause ooh, the vegans are like, Whoa, they're like stick the keto community on steroids. <laughs> on the dogma. Oh my gosh. And it plays on a lot of emotional fears too, like, or emotional, um, plays on the emotions a lot too of like, that's so mean to animals that I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm all about like conventional farming practices of animals. Uh, uh, not okay. That's why I'm so big on regenerative ranching, you know? Um, so I, I get that whole side of things for sure. I'm against that too but done right. Like listen to my, listen to my episode with Eric Perner from rep provisions on inside out health podcasts and what, what they're doing with regenerative ranching. It's freaking rad. Um, you were so caught up in keto for a long time and you did vegan keto. One of the most restrictive diets ever. Yeah. I know when people ask me, can you do a vegan keto? I'm like, no, <laughs> I just like, don't want them to have to go through that. I'm like, you can, but like, it's like, why, why? No. Um, um, if I'm going to get into ketosis and lose fat and reverse insulin resistance, resistance, eating exactly or close to 50 grams of total carbs every day. Oh, are you going to, if you eat 50 grams? So I would say start really low, start really like all, almost carnivore ish in the beginning, just so your body gets the memo. Right. So like, cause what happens is as your body, your body is not used to going into ketosis right now. So as it's like going there, it's going to try to cling to staying and running off of glucose or carbs. So you just need to get it, the, get the memo, like go 20 grams. Like just basically you're just eating mostly meat, a little bit of like salad. That's it. And then you can start gradually getting it back up. But I would definitely for you fat to fit Gabby, I would definitely get a, um, a ketone meter, a blood ketone meter. Keto Mojo is who I recommend. There's a link, discount link in my, on my website. Guys, all of my discount links are on my website under partners and discounts. Get one of those because you need it. We need to see where your ketone levels are. And if you're really insulin resistant, your blood sugar is really high. It's going to be harder to get into ketosis because when blood sugar's up, ketones are down. So you're going to have to like really drop those carbs like crazy in the beginning. Okay. And then you can slowly start building them up over time. Um, yeah, just, if you do my keto in and out thing, like in the Facebook group, just tag me with questions and stuff so that I can help you along your journey. But keto will be awesome for you. I promise. Um, I mean, I can't say that I can't promise, but in my experience, everybody else that I've coached that's in your boat has had a really positive experience. All of them on keto, other people, more lean, super fit people, not always, but in your boat. Yeah. It's like a winter, winter chicken dinner. Um, everyone should be anti-factory farming for sure. Yeah. Dude, if you haven't watched like food Inc from way back in the day, if you haven't seen that, you need to see that you need to understand what's going on with factory farming of animals. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. Um, do exogenous ketones help burn fat? No. <laughs> Plain and simple. Exogenous ketones do not burn your body fat off. This is how um, exogenous ketones based. So here's what, how it works. If you didn't have the exogenous ketones and you were on keto, your body would be forced to break up your fat stores, send them through your liver and turn them into ketones to, to fuel your body. So ex ex exogenous means it's their ketones that are coming from outside the body. Exogenous means from outside the body. So you're taking ketones from outside the body. You're putting them directly in your body, into your bloodstream. So what are they? They're an energy source that's circulating around in your bloodstream and they last for maybe two to three hours. Um, I use them as a, I totally use them as a mental boost because they go through the blood brain barrier and provide an energy, extra energy source to your brain. Super, so I kind of use them almost like a nootropic when I'm on keto. I totally use them as a pre-workout. So I'd have an extra energy boost for my workout. Um, but they do not burn your own body fat and the research is mixed on that. But a lot of the research is done it's like paid for by exogenous ketone companies or people who at least are invested in exogenous ketone companies. So I don't even really know how much I trust the research, but, um, to me, it makes sense that you would almost like stop. They do, we don't know this for sure yet, but for me, it makes sense that you would kind of stop burning using your own body fat. If you put ketones in your blood system and your bloodstream, because 
now why does your body have to go into your fat and make more? You know, just temporarily. I still think it's worth it on keto. I still highly recommend them. Man, they keep your brain on fire. They that salt load, you just you feel like you can do it. You know, they make keto easier. And it's it's not for that long. It's like temporary. So keto and liver damage. What's your view on that? Um, I don't I don't in my experience, I haven't had any um, evidence of anybody that I've worked with having liver damage from keto. Um, in fact, I'd say most people have more, what we've seen is most people have more liver damage from being on Western diets where that are very high in fats and carbohydrates and all these processed foods and, and inflammatory foods and their omega-6 ratio is through the roof and everything's just inflammation like, or, you know, alcohol too on top of it. I'd say keto. Um, I know that I have heard in the community that a lot of people have seen improvements in their liver function from going keto. Um, but I can't say that across the board. What's up, Mike Rashid? got Mr. Famous in the house. Good to see you. Um, let's see, is MCT oil the same? Yeah. So what MCT oil does is go straight through your liver and helps you produce ketones instantly. So cool. Even if you're not on keto, try it, get some MCT oil. Don't do a whole tablespoon if you're not used to it or you will poop your pants. Okay. Start with like half a tablespoon max. But, um, if you have a blood ketone meter, like even if you're not on keto, like try it, you'll see, I'll get like 0 0.4, 0 0.5, like instantly. So I love MCT oil. Um, it's awesome as a nootropic as well, because those ketones again, pass through your blood brain barrier and you start getting more brain energy. It's like a boost. So, um, yeah, I freaking love MCT oil. It's very unlikely for it to be stored as body fat because it's processed immediately through your liver into ketones. So it's like the best hack ever. I love MCT oil. And there is research that shows that people who use MCT oil in addition to like either approach, uh, ketogenic or non-ketogenic diets will have uh, um, better results on weight loss, on fat loss from using MCT, MCT oil in their approach. So I, I'm a huge fan. Um, I like the, I like the, powders myself because you can put them in your coffee and then your coffee's all yummy. But the oil, like I will sometimes like when I'm going to be on podcasts or I might need my brain on fire, I'll just get like a table. I can do a tablespoon cause I'm used to it. Get a tablespoon of oil. Boom. And I'm like, hello world. I'm a superhuman. <laughs> all right. Um, do exogenous ketones prevent you from creating your own ketones? That's, that's the, the, the verdict is out on that. We don't know, but I'm like on a common sense level. It's like, yeah, they, they've got to like, why would your body why would your body keep making as many ketones when your bloodstream is saturated with them? I, I don't know. I don't know for sure, but to me, it seems like it's kind of like testosterone. You know what I mean? It's like all of the things when you're giving your body a bunch of it, why would your body feel the need to be making a bunch more? Can you use MCT oil if you fast? You can, but like I would just fat. If you're going to fast, just freaking fast, you know, like get all the things out, like do it right. Like just drink water. That's it. Like, don't even have coffee. Like, just let your body, give your body a freaking break for a second. You know, that's, that's how I see it. So like, that would be a modified fast. People do modified fast all the time. They do bone broth fast because they want to send all those amino acids and collagen to their gut lining to help with healing. Um, they do things like, you know, just coffee or just do, do you do whatever you want. But a, a true fast is like a true fast is nothing, not even water, right? Like how they do with Ramadan. Like a, that's, that's it. That's legit. That's legit fasting. Then you can do water fast. You can do all sorts of modified fasts, but the research is cool. If you look at it, there's some research from the middle East on dry fasting. That means no water. It is a little more advantageous. Um, they show that you will break up more of more fat cells is what they found. And they think the reason why is because water is released when you break up fat cells, the body is looking for water because it doesn't have enough from the dry fast. All right. I got to go guys. I got to get a little teeny tiny workout in before my bikini competition tomorrow. Just get some blood flow, blood flow. And I got to jump on a call with my clients in a minute here. I'd suggest weaning off of caffeine before cutting it out cold Turkey. Otherwise you're going to suffer during your fast. Well, I have, so I've done, so I do, I, caffeine is definitely my vice. You guys, that is definitely my vice. I'm not even going to try to pretend like for a second that I'm not addicted to caffeine. I am, but I have done, um, so I, I will do little caffeine breaks every once in a while. And I have found that the first day for me, the first day after I'm good, it's like the second and third day that I'm like, wow, I'm really tired. <laughs> so you might be able to make it if you just do, um, like, you know, 24 hours, but man, if you can't go, if you can't go 24 hours without coffee, 
That means that you have blocked your adenosine receptors so freaking much that you're, I mean, if you will do yourself a big favor if you can just take one or two days off of caffeine because then you'll resensitize yourself. Actually, I think they said to actually resensitize yourself. You need like, I think seven to 10 days, all right? Because you start building more and more receptors. That's why caffeine used to keep me more and more and more. So you got to take breaks. All right. Okay. Thanks guys. Thanks for the good, the good luck wishes. I appreciate you all. You got, I wrote, I wrote about you guys and my gratitude this morning, um, that I was grateful because I've gotten so much support, so many messages from you guys. And I, I really appreciate that. It makes me feel very like loved and supported. I'm going to do my best. You guys know standing on a bikini, standing on a stage in a bikini, thong bikini and heels is not exactly my freaking jam. So <laughs> I'm going to try to own it as much as I can. <laughs> All right. Appreciate you all. Have a great day. Bye.